thank you all for joining today, a very um, special day. So uh, it's been an incredible privilege um, to know Anya and to work with her for the last bunch of years. Um, it started in the afternoon on December 29th, 2013. I got an email from a girl named Anya. I was then wrapping up my postdoc um, and getting ready to start my lab at MGH. And she was a freshman at the University of Miami. And she was starting to think about graduate school, as one does, <laughs> no typical freshman. Um, she, sounded, um, she sounded bright, mature, and ambitious, and also like someone who really knows what she wants. And so we stayed in touch. She visited Boston and did a project with me and uh, Dan Blanc remotely. Um, and from the earliest discussions, when I would ask her about the kinds of questions she was interested in, she always talked about her interest in meaning, in how people think, and in the role that language might play in these processes. And I thought that was boding pretty well because those are some of the biggest questions we can wonder about in understanding um, humans. So through all these interactions we had early on, it was clear that Anya is the kind of person uh, who would do great things in science and life. So I encouraged her to apply to BCS. Um, and um, I was uh, myself then at MGH, but I was hoping that somehow through collaborations with Nancy and others, I would get a chance to uh, work with Anya as well. Um, and we were extremely lucky that she indeed joined um, MIT for her graduate school. It's really quite amazing how much Anya accomplished in the last five years, um, in spite of two, almost two of those years being the pandemic years. So research-wise, she answered a few big open questions about the relationship uh, between language and thought, as she'll tell you about in her talk, um, including discovery of a potentially new selectivity, which is something I thought can kind of not, not happen anymore in this day and age. Um, she already published two empirical papers and co-authored a position paper in Trends of Cognitive Sciences and another paper is in Revision and three more in the works. She also, again, during the, uh, kind of in the midst of the pandemic, organized a so-called generative adversarial collaboration at the CCN conference, bringing together a few faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, and tackling a really cool question about the role of um, mapping models in neuroscience and what kind of models may be suited for different scenarios. And that resulted in a beautiful write-up, kind of with a set of guidelines for when you might rely uh, on different kinds of mapping models for different goals. Um, and she has a few exciting things in the works, including a cool collaboration with Eric Martinez and Ted Gibson and reasoning about legal decisions. Uh, she's also um, a big part of this ongoing project with Jacob Andreas, Josh Tenenbaum, and others on meaning in minds, brains, and uh, large language models. And last but not least, she's also starting a collaboration with Alex Huth, trying to relate his approach to meaning, which is kind of as this very distributed system in the brain, to some of her own work, which finds um, sometimes more uh, local representations of different aspects of meaning. Anya works amazingly well with everyone, as anybody in the lab and the broader community will vouch. Uh, she's the kind of collaborator you want. She doesn't drop any balls. She's incredibly clear in her thinking, one of the best thinkers I know. And she just gets stuff done. And she's just really good at connecting, connecting people, connecting ideas, different theoretical traditions, different methodological approaches. And um, it's just, I think she's just the kind of person who will um, uh, become a real leader uh, in the field in the very near future. She's also a wonderful teacher and educator. I've witnessed this in several contexts, including numerous guest lectures, but also lab discussions about both academic and important non-academic issues. She makes people think, and she's great at engaging them, so talking with them and not at them, something I've been trying to learn from her myself. It's a great, great skill to have as an academic. And she's already great at mentoring, so she's mentored a few undergraduates and a high school student, all of whom ended up with co-authorships on her papers, which is a great feat that doesn't often happen, um, even with um, uh, good undergrads. So I think that speaks a lot to her um, great mentorship. And finally, on a personal note, Anya is just a wonderful human being. She deeply cares about the world uh, being a good and fair place for everyone. She dedicated a lot of her time and effort here to advocating for graduate students at MIT, uh, including also being an editor at um, uh, Grad Blog for two years, where she openly shared her experiences, including challenges of um, her graduate path. Um, she's also one of Ollie's favorites, which I think is also <laughs> <laughs> speaks to um, a lot. And um, uh, I also know that Anya is a wonderful daughter and um, older sister to her three siblings. I was lucky enough to uh, meet Anya's parents when I attended a conference in Moscow. Um, and I'm just really excited to share with you all my pride and the pride I know her family must feel um, with all of you today. And let's hear from Anya. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Ev. Um, yeah, I'll get to it later on, but I am incredibly lucky and honored to be here, to work with you and all of the people that you've connected me with uh, and feel all the support from this community, bright ideas, but also amazing people. So you all are absolutely amazing. So as Ev mentioned, I am really interested in this big open question about the relationship between language and thought. And by thought, here I really mean just broader human cognition, all the amazing intellectual feats that we can accomplish as humans that aren't linguistic per se, but that uh, many have connected to language in some capacity. This is a question that has interested people from very different fields, from philosophy to psychology to linguistics, computer science, and some have expressed pretty strong views about the extent of this relationship. Ludwig Wittgenstein stated that the limits of my language means the limits of my world. You can't imagine things you can't express. Edward Sapir said, language and our thought groups are inextricably interwoven, are in a sense one and the same. And Noam Chomsky stated that the systems of thought use linguistic expressions for reasoning, interpretation, organizing action, and other mental acts. And so these people are actually really different. If you know anything about them, it's kind of surprising that they're all here on one slide. But they have all posited this really strong connection between language and thought. And I'm just going to hide. Did we start recording? We did not. Did it, uh... Great. All right, but of course, uh, this view about this very tight connection between language and thought, languages and human intelligence is not the only one. Uh, there are people, including people um, here at MIT, who have expressed different views. Ray Jackendoff, who is here in the audience, uh, wrote in uh, one of his books, thought is independent of language and can take place in the absence of language, really highlighting the distinction between the mechanisms we use to process language and the mechanisms we use to think. Mary Potter, who is a uh, professor emerita here, did a lot of beautiful behavioral work to show that the representation of the meaning of a sentence is neither verbal nor imagistic, but abstract. So even when you're processing a sentence or a word, the final representation that you end up with is not linguistic per se. And when I started my PhD, a paper had just come out by these two beautiful women, Ev and Rosemary Varley, uh, stating that language and thought are not the same thing. And they supported this claim with evidence from neuroimaging and neurological patients. And so all of these uh, people hold the view that language and thought are distinct and really emphasize the dissociation between the two. And so in my work, I continued to explore this relationship between language and thought using tools from cognitive neuroscience. So in this talk today, I will first introduce you to the language network in the human brain and, um, and tell you why I think cognitive neuroscience can serve as a valuable source of evidence for answering this inherently cognitive question about the language-thought relationship. I will then talk about a couple of specific cases of human cognitive capacities that might rely on language because they're similar to language in some important way. One of them is computer code comprehension. The other one is nonverbal semantic processing, so extracting meaning from pictures. And I'm going to be telling you about object semantics and event semantics. I will then build upon this earlier work to ask are there a model semantic regions outside the language network that might be doing a lot of the semantic heavy lifting, but are not part of the language net network itself? And then I will conclude by describing the place of the language network as a piece in our cognitive toolbox using the broader field of cognitive neuroscience as kind of a backdrop. All right, so let's start with the background. 
So our goal in this line of work is to use neural evidence and mainly fMRI to test a cognitive theory, namely that language serves as a foundation for certain aspects of thought. And so the intuition here goes something like the following. We want to establish the relationship between language and thought, and so we can measure the neural responses to language and the neural responses to some aspect of thought and compare the two, and that's going to give us insight about this cognitive relationship. So we go in between the neural and the cognitive levels here. This doesn't always work. Like There is no guarantee that we can just make this jump by default. And the reason why is that we can only make that leap if we have a good linking function between a cognitive phenomenon, language, and the neural phenomenon, brain activity in a certain brain region or a set of brain regions. And so before we jump in and start looking at the question of language separability from the rest of cognition, we want to know, can we reliably identify the neural correlates of language processing in humans? So can we find brain regions that respond specifically to language in a way that's consistent across studies and across people and across conditions? And so um, we have decades of evidence from uh, neurological patients showing that there are selective deficits in language processing if a certain part of the brain is damaged. But uh, let's say we didn't know that, or you know, it doesn't necessarily help us find the uh, language regions in healthy brains. So if we just have an fMRI machine and we want to identify the language regions, what can we do? Well, we can show people a sentence, like, Nobody could have predicted the earthquake. And presumably, it will activate the language regions so that we can understand the meaning of the sentence. In line with the classical design uh, in cognitive neuroscience, we don't want to just have one condition. We want to contrast it with a condition that's similar in features that we don't care about, like visual properties, but different in something important, like language. And so here, we're contrasting it with non-word reading, like ubis be aquarelium and around my plus poem, which, you know, obviously, uh, it kind of sounds like language is pronounceable. It looks like language, but it has no meaning. And so if we look where in the brain we have regions that respond more to sentences than to non-words, we get a map like this. this is a beautiful uh, probabilistic overlap map collected from 800 participants that um, Ev and people in the lab have scanned on this language localizer task. And uh, we see a lot of consistency in the temporal lobe and um, uh, some consistent activation in the frontal lobe as well. So are we done? Is that the language network? Well, not quite. One reason why we can't just take that and project it in each brain and say, well, this is the language network is because there is a lot of individual variability across people. Anatomically identical regions have different response profiles, different functions across people. So we can't just use the same map on each brain. So we need an approach that will allow us to localize the language network in each individual brain. And uh, to do so, we can start with a set of parcels that roughly mark the location of the language regions in uh, a person's brain. But then we select a subset of these parcels that responds more strongly to sentences compared to non-words. And that's what we're going to call a language network in, in each individual person. And the location of this person will vary slightly from person to person. And so now that we have this language network defined, we can measure its responses to various conditions of interest. We can see whether it responds to different kinds of language, whether it responds to things that are not language. So we can just go ahead, measure how strongly it responds to various conditions of interest. <coughs> OK, so in some sense, this approach is pretty simple. right? We just showed people a bunch of sentences, <coughs> contrasted it with a bunch of things that are kind of like sentences but not. So, you know, maybe we just found then like English language network, or maybe we just found the reading network. There is no guarantee that it really is the language network that we're looking for. But turns out that it is. If you localize this network using an auditory task like spoken language versus um, muffled spoken language, you get pretty much the same network. So it's not just about visual input. You also get the same network for all of these different languages from all of these language groups, this uh, beautiful paper uh, 
from the lab came out uh, just um, recently, and this is only a subset of the languages that got tested. So it's not just about English. It's not just about the tasks that we use during the localizer. This paper is not even in the thesis because it's not written up yet, but here we uh, had people do the language localizer with different tasks, so passive sentence reading, memory probe, comprehension questions, and sentiment, positive, negative, and the language network is the same no matter which task you use to find it, and the same holds for some other brains as well. It is functionally connected, so not only do we get this like haphazard set of brain regions that all happen to respond to sentences, these regions act together as a coherent whole. Their activity is correlated across time during language comprehension, but also at rest. And so you can find this network using just this correlation data in resting brains. This network is engaged in both comprehension and production. And it is causally implicated in language functions such that the extent of the damage to the language network in people with brain damage correlates with the extent of the language impairment. And so all of this evidence really tells us that this is the set of regions that really does some core aspects of language processing in human brains. Which means we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between entities at the cognitive level, language, and at the neural level, activity in the language network. Yay! So we can now say that we can use neural evidence to test a cognitive theory because we have a good linking function between cognition and neural stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to measure activity in the language network to language, but also to some other non-linguistic tasks and see whether indeed language supports all of these other functions or some of these other functions. So what do we know so far? What do we know about the selectivity of the language network? Uh, we, uh, well, Ev did a beautiful study in 2011 uh, that where she measured the responses of the language network to the localizer condition, sentences and non-words, but also to a whole other host of other conditions that are not language, math, work in memory, MSIT and Struka cognitive control tasks, and music. So all pretty high level cognitive tasks, some combinatorial, some just hard. And so what she found is the following. This net the network responded strongly to sentences, a little bit to non-words, and not at all to any of the other tasks, suggesting that indeed the language network is really selective for language and not just any kind of hard compositional cognitive inputs. And uh, we also have convergent evidence from patients with aphasia, and in particular individuals with global aphasia, which is a severe impairment of language comprehension and production, which typically results from a massive stroke. And uh, this is a brain of one such individual. You can see that a huge chunk of cortex is gone, and it's. Uh, if you overlay the probabilistic map of language activations over this brain, you can see that the language centers um, are essentially gone in this person. And you can tell that behaviorally because they have really severe issues with language. And so the question is, if your language network is missing, how much more can you do? Can you think? Can you reason about the world? Do you really need language to understand the world around you? And the answer seems not really. There are patients who have global aphasia but are nonetheless able to perform math, reason about cause and effect, think about other people, to so perform social cognition, do spatial navigation, and process music, identify sour notes, and stuff like that. And so we have converging evidence from fMRI and from global aphasia that points to the functional specialization of the language network. What I wanted to do in my work is to see how far we can push this conclusion. How far can we go? What if we test functions that are really similar to language in some important ways, right? So maybe the functions as so far, they're really different, but language does serve as an important uh, source of functionality for some functions. So one such uh, cognitive function is computer programming, which has similar structure to natural language, 
And the other one is picture semantics that has similar meaning to uh, the sentence inputs, or at least we can match that. And so let's just jump right into the first one, computer code comprehension. Why do they say that computer code and language are similar structurally? So on the left, you, you see a math problem that is expressed in words. And on the right, you see the same problem expressed in code. This is Python. So you see some typical things like variable assignment. Then you get some calculation. And, and the result gets assigned to a new variable. And then it's printed out. And so in both cases, what you need to do to understand the message is you first need to process the words or tokens of the input. You then need to connect them into sentences and statements using syntactic rules, so order matters. Uh, you then need to con connect the sentences and statements into a text or a program to establish the links between them. And then you'll get at the meaning of the text and the program. Once you do that, you can then do whatever you want to do with the text, answer a question, uh, predict the output of a program, find bugs, etc. And so you can see the similarity because programming languages like Python are written, they even use English letters. Here, even the identifiers I chose are English words. The print function is an English word. So there are, there's a lot of similarity you might expect uh, to see in the neural responses. Uh, of the language network to sentences and to code. And so that's what we set out to test. We presented our participants with code problems and matching sentence problems. Uh, experiment one was Python, which you've seen. Experiment two was a very different programming language as we wanted to see how far the results would generalize. And we picked Scratch Junior, which is a graphical programming language for kids. It's a, set, it's a series of blocks that gives instructions to cartoon characters for movies or games. And it can be very simple, but it also has control elements like for loops and if statements and stuff like that. And so here we also match the code with the corresponding sentence version of the problem. And so we then measure the responses in the language regions to um, the localizer conditions, right, sentence reading and non-word reading, and our two critical conditions, sentence problems and code problems. And as you've seen before, the language network responds more to sentences than to non-words. We also see that it responds quite strongly to sentence problems, which makes sense because, well, it's language. And the key question was how strongly does it respond to code problems? And we see that it responds a little bit. Its response is stronger than response to non-words, but not nearly as strong as the response to sentence problems, suggesting that hmm, maybe yeah, there's some response to Python in the language network, but it's not as strong as response to language itself. What about Scratch Junior? In Scratch Junior, we also see strong responses to sentence reading and sentence problems, low responses to non-word reading. How strong is the response to code problems? We see that the response is really low. The language network does not care at all about Scratch Junior, suggesting that it's not engaged in computer code comprehension for Scratch Junior, a graphical programming language. OK, so if it's not the language network that's doing computer code processing, what network might be doing this instead? To answer this question, we turn to a different network known as the multiple demand network. It's known to be engaged in a set of cognitively challenging tasks. And the harder the task, the more strongly it's engaged. It also stores some domain-specific knowledge, like intuitive physics knowledge, and, and it responds to logic and math problems. So it seemed like a good candidate. If not the language network, maybe this network responds to code. And that's exactly what we see. We see that it responds strongly to code problems. And importantly, it responds more strongly to code than to sentence problems, suggesting that it's not just about answering the question and solving the underlying problem. There is something specific to getting to the meaning of a code sequence that activates this network. And so to summarize this part, we see that the language network has weak responses to Python code and no responses to Scratch Junior. In contrast, the multiple demand network exhibits robust responses to both programming languages. So that network really seems to be essential for computer code comprehension. 
we are doing some follow-up work. My great collaborators, Shash and Ben, are looking into the representation stored inside the language in multiple domain networks for Python to see what kind of information is encoded there. So maybe we'll see what kind of information triggers the language network for Python specifically. And one more thing I wanted to mention about this line of work is that we published it in um, eLife, but we weren't alone. We had a co-submission from Marina Bedney's group who did an experiment similar to ours uh, with a somewhat different setup, but it's arrived at essentially the same conclusion that it's the multiple demand or the front of parietal network and not the language network that seems to be supporting computer pro code processing. So this is a really nice example of two groups working in parallel and arriving at roughly the same result and just working synergistically together at the end. All right, so does the language network carry out computer code comprehension? I'm going to say no with some caveats that there is some follow-up work to be done on Python. Okay, so in the next section, we're gonna talk about non-verbal semantic processing. And this is definitely a hot topic. There is a lot of debate about the relationship between language and meaning. Where is the line? How does this work? So uh, really exciting and really complex. So just to clarify what I mean here, by semantics, I really just mean conceptual thought. I know you can make distinctions between these concepts. I'm using them interchangeably here, pretty much. And so you might imagine that we have a concept like a cat and so this concept binds together information about what cats look like, what the word for cat is and all the languages that you might speak, what cats sound like, and also links to a whole bunch of other concepts and facts, like the fact that cats are animals, cats are pets, cats drink milk, etc. And so we're not gonna think specifically about what form this concept takes, but let's just assume that something like that exists in the brain. And we can ask a lot of really interesting questions about the relationship between conceptual thought and language. I'm only going to talk about one of them, but I just want to show you the breadth of this space. So one claim you might make is that concepts are the same thing as words, right? So that's the idea that you encode meaning linguistically and then use words as concepts. Uh, that was a very popular idea early on, less popular now, some pretty good evidence against it. The second claim is that conceptual knowledge engages the language regions, that maybe concepts are not words, but the language network is getting reused for semantic processing as well, or maybe some part of it is, some regions within it. And the third claim is that conceptual knowledge can be learned from language alone, so uh, if you get exposed to language but not to a certain perceptual modality, can you acquire concepts from that modality? And that's a very cool, exciting question with a lot of fun work with uh, implications for AI, and I'm not talking about it today. I'm talking about claim two, conceptual knowledge engages the language regions. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, we're just gonna run an experiment and see how the language network responds, same as before. The experiment we ran here is the following. We showed people um, a category label, an instruction that reads like, please find animals that live in water, and you can kind of go along for each animal. You can say whether it lives in water or not. So a bear no. does not live in the water. <laughs> This one, yes. This one, no. no. Great, so uh, that's the task. And you can see that it consisted of two stages. Uh, one was the instruction stage where you read the category label, right, you've been told what to look for. And the second stage was the categorization itself. So that one is not linguistic by nature. You only see in pictures. I like, gave you a hint with the bear in the beginning, but, but people really only see pictures. And so that's the stage where we really want to know whether the language network gets engaged or not. We also showed people categories from a, of a different kind. So please find things that are blue. And then we did the same thing. We showed them objects. You don't have to scream this time. You can. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's the same task. It looks very similar. But the big difference here is that you don't need to know anything about these objects in order to answer the prompt. Blue is a perceptual property not intrinsic to the object. If I replace these pictures with words, you wouldn't be able to, to do the task. Whereas for the first category, you would. 
And so we have two types of categories, semantic categories and perceptual categories. And so what we might hypothesize about the role of the language network in this task is the following. We have a null hypothesis that the language network is not involved in object categorization or object semantics, whether semantic or perceptual, right? No matter the category, the response will be low. Uh, our H1 is that the language network is engaged in all label-based categorization. I gave you the task instructions in language, so maybe you need to recall the instructions every time you do the categorization task, and so you get activity in the language regions because you need to think about the label. And H2 is that the language network is engaged in semantic but not perceptual categorization, so maybe there is something special about semantic processing because of this close relationship between language and meaning that triggers activity in the language network for semantic categories but not for perceptual categories. Okay, so here are our responses in the language network to our, our favorite language localizer task. This is the response to the instruction stage, which is high, and it makes sense because that's when you read the labels. And the key question is, what are the responses to semantic and perceptual categories? And the responses are really low. They're as low as non-words, and they're not different between semantic and perceptual categories. So even though the instructions were specified to you uh, verbally, and some of these um, categories are semantic in nature, we don't see response in the language network which leads us to conclude that H0 is correct. The language network is not involved in object categorization, whether semantic or perception. And now let's move on to event semantics. Why do we care about event semantics? Why is, not, why is object semantics not enough? The main reason why is compositionality. So if you have an event the fox is chasing the rabbit, and you're trying to see whether this event is plausible or not, you'll start with either the sentence or the picture. The first thing you'll do, you'll identify the words or the pictures within this event, uh, or the objects within this event. You will then need to identify the relations between them. You'll need to know who is the agent doing the chasing and who is the patient being chased. You will then need to retrieve the world knowledge about this interaction. What are the typical fox-rabbit interactions? Is it common for the fox to chase the rabbit? And then you can conclude that, yes, this is a plausible event. And clearly, whether you start from the sentence or the picture, this processing will converge at some point. At least, you know, this process of pressing the button will engage the same mechanisms no matter where you started. And so the question is, how far up does the convergence happen? And does it happen within the language network? Right? Is the language network, for example, responsible for identifying agents and patients? And so in this experiment, we presented participants with sentences and pictures of events. Uh, a sample event is the jester is entertaining the king versus the king is entertaining the jester. And so you can see that we're manipulating plausibility by switching around the agent and the patient. So the words are the same, but the relation changes. And we had people do one of the two tasks. The semantic task would just say whether the event is plausible or implausible, and the perceptual task is to see, say whether the stimulus on the screen is moving left or right. Both senses and pictures were moving slowly. It was kind of hard. We were trying to match the, those tasks in difficulty. And so then we wanted to see how the language network responds to both kinds of stimuli for both kinds of tasks. And so our hypothesis is that the language network is not engaged in pictorial event semantics, so the response to that condition would be low. Or the language network is engaged in pictorial event semantics, the response to that condition would be high. And so here you see responses for the three other conditions. So sentences during the semantic task is high. Sentences during the perceptual task and pictures during the perceptual task is low. People are just monitoring where the stimulus goes on the screen. They're not thinking about the meaning. That makes sense. And the key question is, what is the response to pictures during the semantic task? Is it as high as the sentences during the semantic task or as low as the rest? And the answer is it's somewhere in between. We see an interaction here between stimulus type and task. And so it doesn't fit neatly with either of the hypotheses we posited at the beginning. So we have to propose something like H2. The, lang the language network is somewhat engaged in pictorial event semantics. It's doing something. Uh, but it's not as strong as the response to sentences. 
And the same response pattern holds across all the regions within the network. So it's not just that a subset of them responds and, uh, and a subset doesn't. And one thing to note here is that this result generalizes across experiments. We did three variations of this experiment. I'll tell you more about them a little bit later. But this response profile holds when you change something about the task, something about the stimuli. So it's not just a fluke. It, it, it really holds. One thing we still cannot conclude from these data is how important is this activation to picture semantics? That is it causally implicated in doing the task? Can you still do the task without the language network getting involved? And correlational evidence like fMRI cannot really give us the answer in most cases. And so here we were lucky enough to collaborate with Rosemary Varley and her team to get some evidence from individuals with global aphasia. So we have two individuals with global aphasia and 12 age match controls. For, they perform really poorly on any tasks that involve language, if you remember. So here we had them match sentences and pictures, like the candling and the gesture, which one is correct of the pictures. And they're a chance or almost a chance. So severe impairment in language as expected. And the question was, can they still do this, the picture plausibility task? Can they look at the picture and say if it's plausible or not? And they can. They perform pretty much at the level of control participants, uh, which is very impressive because it suggests really clearly a dissociation between the ability to use language and the ability to extract meaning from a picture. And so with this evidence, we can refine our H2 to say that the language network is recruited but not required for pictorial event semantics. There is some response. Uh, doesn't seem to be essential for performing the task, or at least it's not the only way of doing the task. So does the language network carry out nonverbal semantic processing? Uh, maybe a little bit, but not causally important for doing the task. OK, well, if it's not the language network that's doing this uh, semantic processing, what regions are? Is it the multiple demand network, as for code? Is it something else? So this is. Uh, where we ask this question, are there amodal semantic regions outside the language network, amodal meaning that they respond to pictures and sentences pretty much equally strongly, but also responsive to semantic task and not just, you know, every time you see a picture, you do something. And so this is a deep and meaningful question, right? Are there meaning regions in the brain? Um, and um, other regions that respond to meaning regardless of form and sentences versus pictures. This is an important question, which means we're not the first ones to ask it. Many studies have looked at the overlap between picture and, the, and uh, sentence semantics in the brain. This is roughly what they find. They find left lateralized regions, um, frontal regions, temporal regions, sometimes parietal regions. You see that there is some consistency, but also some discrepancies. These are all group maps, so we don't know exactly how they relate to each other. Also, some of these methods are univariate, some are multivariate. So it's a little hard to interpret, and not just for the reasons I just mentioned of the different methods, but oftentimes we don't know what the effect size is. We don't know if these regions respond equally strongly to sentences and pictures. We don't know how much this result is task specific. Oftentimes the study only use one task, and so maybe it's the task that drives it. And uh, oftentimes they don't do an independent language task. So we don't know whether these regions that they find is just the language network or certain parts of the language network, or whether these are regions that are different in some way. And so what we did is we tried to address at least some of these issues. First of all, we try to account for inter-individual variability using functional localization and not just group maps. We test generalization across stimuli and tasks, at least a little bit. We try to vary things around. And we explicitly compare our results with the language network, both in terms of location and in terms of effect sizes. We see is it similar to the language network in the way it responds to stimuli, and also does it, do these regions, if they exist, overlap with the language regions. And so what we did is we had three event experiments. Experiment three is the one that I've already shown you, so that's the gesture entertaining the king one. Experiments one and two are um, experiments describing animate-inanimate interactions, like a man is peeling a carrot 
Each of them had corresponding pictures to go along with them. Um, and you can see that in the first two experiments, these are color photographs. In the third one, these are line drawings, so we're changing that as well. And then for all of them, we had people do a semantic and a perceptual task, like before, but the exact tasks differ. In experiments one and three, it's a plausibility task. In, event, in experiment two, the, all of the events are plausible, but the task is, is the action reversible or irreversible? And the perceptual task differs too. So we're really trying to see whether the results would get generalized across all of these manipulations in stimulus content and the types of events and the types of tasks that people are doing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look for regions in the brain that respond more strongly to sentences during the semantic task than to sentences during the perceptual task, and more strongly to pictures during the semantic task than to pictures during the perceptual task. So that's a conjunction analysis, essentially. And then uh, we are going to derive a set of parcels that roughly mark the location of these regions, and then specify the exact regions and in individual participants, similarly to what we did with the language network. OK, so what do these parcels look like? They look like this. This is what we get. So as in other studies, they are left lateralized. They um, encompass parts of the frontal lobe, posterior temporal, inferior parietal, some visual stuff, and right cerebellum. Um, I'm personally excited about the right cerebellum stuff. I don't know. I like seeing cerebellum engaged in <laughs> cognition. Uh, we can zoom in uh, onto one of these regions to see its response profile. And we see its responses to sentences during the semantic task and pictures during the semantic tasks are roughly the same, which is cool because that's not what we specified. We just wanted to have a difference between semantic and perceptual tasks for both stimuli types, but we didn't ask this network to have equally strong responses to both. So that's kind of exciting. And another thing to see is that these responses are pretty consistent across the three experiments. So we see that it's robust to variations in the design that we've introduced. And this response pattern roughly holds across all of these regions with minor variations. So the average response profile looks exactly the same. There is the effect of task, but no effect of stimulus type sentences versus pictures. And interestingly enough, we can also now see whether these regions are similar to the language regions and the multiple demand regions. We see that they respond to the semantic task, but do they respond to sentences more than to non-words, like the language regions that you've seen in every single graph before? They do not. They actually respond equally strongly to sentences and non-words. Um, this bar is also kind of driven by the visual region, so most of them respond pretty weakly to both sentences and non-words. And then if we want to know whether this result is task-driven, whether this result is really, whether this response to semantic task is because it's a hard task, we can look at responses to the spatial working memory task which is not semantic and its content and really drives the multiple demand network strongly. And we see that its responses are really low. So it's not just about general cognitive tasks. It's really something about semantics that drives its regions. So that's a new functional response profile that like, we haven't gotten in the lab before. It's uh, pretty exciting. We can also look at where these functional regions, uh, where these networks live in the brains um, of two sample participants. And you can see semantic regions in yellow and uh, language regions in red and multiple domain regions in blue. And you see that there is very little overlap. There is a little bit in Angular Jarris, and I can comment on that if you'd like. Uh, but in general, we really see that the semantic regions are different from both the language network and the multiple demand network in their selectivity profiles and in their location in the brain, which is very cool. And I should be starting to wrap up, but the one thing I'll mention is that um, there is a response profile like that that's been reported previously in the literature, and it's known as the semantic control regions. So that seems to be roughly what we're finding, regions that respond to meaning in the context of, of a semantic task, where when you're told to extract a certain semantic features and you go for it. The difference between us and prior works is that oftentimes 
uh, people think that the semantic control regions are part of the language network, that the frontal bit in, that responds to language is also the same one that does semantic tasks, we see that these bits are actually distinct. So very exciting, seems to be something else in addition to the language network that cares about meaning invariant to format. So are there amodal semantic regions outside the language network? Yes, there are. So to summarize what I've talked to you about so far, I've introduced you to the language network and explained why I think we can use language network activity profiles to answer questions about the relationship between language and other aspects of human cognition. I've shown that the language network is not engaged in computer code comprehension, is not engaged in nonverbal semantic processing with some potential ex exception for event semantics, and that there are regions outside the language network that seem to be doing some task-driven semantic processing. And so in the last few minutes, I just wanted to zoom out a little bit and share with you how excited I am about cognitive science as a way <laughs> for us to shed light on the way we reason, the way we think, what components make up the human mind. So we asked this question, what is the relationship between language and thought? We've shown that uh, for the large part, the, they seem to be distinct. And if you look at other cognitive neuroscience literature, it just makes so much sense, right? So we've talked about the language network that carries linguistic knowledge, these putative semantic regions that are responsible for semantic tasks, but there is so much more. There are social regions like the theory of mind network that carries social information. There is the multiple demand network that you've seen that responds to cognitive tasks very generally. There is the default mode network that is active at rest and is responsible for checking information over long time courses and possibly for things like situation modeling. And there are just so many regions inside the brain that store specific information about certain aspects of world knowledge. So human intelligence is really uh, not based on language rather than language is just one piece of this beautiful big picture. But I also don't want to leave you with this picture because it assumes that all of these components are kind of separate, that you'd only do language in the language regions, that you only do social knowledge in the social regions. But in fact, of course, all of these modules interact with each other all of the time. So what we might consider real life language and real life language use will be much more complex. So you have the language regions responsible for core language knowledge, but then they, ex they exchange information with the social regions to infer the intent of the person and to do some kinds of pragmatic processing. They interface with a default mode network to track inf information and about situations and entities across the whole story, across the whole narrative. They, um, when you hear a story, you activate not just the language regions, but a whole swath of cortex, which this map from Alec Huth's paper from 2016 shows really beautifully. So you activate all kinds of knowledge in a domain-specific way as you listen to, to somebody talking, like me. Uh, you, the language network works with the multiple demand network to process language when it's hard to understand, when it's noisy or ambiguous, and of course with semantic re uh, regions if you need to do a semantic task. And so it's a really beautiful picture that shows us the complexity of this question. That it's not just like, oh, yes, the language network is engaged. No, it's not engaged. In real life language use, you see different components contributing to language processing in very specific ways. And language, the language network doing kind of the core of it. So it's very cool and it has, inter it has interesting implications for AI. So these large language models that aim to do real life language use um, are trying to do all of that because you need all of these components for the master language, really. And they seem to be really good at core language knowledge and really bad at some other things like pragmatics or tracking information outside of their context window because they're just not meant to do that. And so I think this is a place where cognitive science can really yield a lot of insight in how we can design systems that master real life language use. And we have a paper coming in it soon with Kyle Mahowald and others. And um, by soon, me, it means that we are continuing to refine those ideas. <laughs> and you know, hopefully, hopefully sometime when it's still relevant, uh, they, they will be out because I think it's a really, really exciting area. OK. And I need some water for this. <laughs>
Um, a PhD is a really long process, and mine took five years, which is not a lot compared to many other people, but it still think, feels like so much has changed in those five years. And I actually have um, a way to track my progress throughout the PhD, because uh, my uh, advisor's daughter, Lana, was born on the very first day of my PhD, and is now this uh, precocious, beautiful, smart, almost five-year-old. And so um, I feel kind of similar that, you know, my, prog <laughs> my progress has not been as impressive as Lana's, but I also feel like I've grown a lot and learned a lot in these five years. And of course, the person that, well, both of us should be think, thanking a lot is Ev. Uh, Ev uh, is an amazing advisor. I cannot find the words to say how lucky I am to have worked with you. Uh, I don't have a written out speech prepared. Uh, but uh, I just really appreciate how um, excited you are about science, but at the same time, very responsible and careful. I uh, love how collaborative you are and the huge network you've built, working with many other people that I've been able to benefit from. All of this work, of course, I've set up the framework, and I just kind of followed along, extended it in certain ways, and uh, it's been such an amazing, exciting journey, thinking really deeply about the brain and the mind. and. Uh, we were joined on this journey by the owner of the brain that's in between us, which is Nancy Canvisher. Uh, Nancy has guided me along the way as well. I've been, I've, I've been to lab meetings. I've gotten advice from Nancy on all kinds of life and career things. Nancy's enthusiasm for science is very contagious. Both, both Ev and Nancy are amazing role models for women in science, and I'm so, so, so lucky to be able to work with you both. I also want to thank my committee, uh, Roger, Marina, and Josh. You've contributed to my personal growth in many different ways, some through direct conversation, some through the work that you've done, some through the projects I was able to complete under your guidance. And uh, this community of uh, thinkers um, in this department and beyond uh, is just incredible and I've grown so much and I really love the interdisciplinary aspect of it. Speaking of which, I have a lot of collaborators over, over, over all of those projects, uh, which I think is actually pretty rare. I don't think it's very common for a PhD student to work with a lot of people uh, over, over, like over all of those projects. But I really love the collaborative aspect of science. I think it motivates me to do better work and, well, to do work, period. Uh, in, in bold, there are people who, uh, who I've uh, co-first co authored papers with, and uh, in italics are some of my mentees, and I'm really grateful to every single one of you. Uh, I really love how collaborative our field is or how collaborative it can be. A special thanks, of course, goes to EvLab, which has been my community uh, through all of these years. Ev really treats her uh, lab as a family, and so we spend a lot of time together. We support each other. We spend time together in lab, after lab, on retreats, uh, and um, it's, it's really great. Uh, and I guess I have to say, like, EvLab and TevLab. So for instance, one of my collaborators is um, Kyle Mahowald, who was here way before me. And we uh, met up a few months ago. And we just really felt that we came from the same family. We had the same things to talk about. We had the same community. So uh, it's so important to get support in grad school. And EvLab has been the source of support for me. And I am really, really grateful to every single member. I am also grateful to other labs with whom I've interacted a lot and learned a lot from, Canvasher Lab, Levy Lab, TED Lab. I have many friends in these labs. I've learned a lot about science and different angles and different questions that you might ask. And uh, really, really, really grateful to all of you. Uh, also grateful to my cohort with whom we've started our first year of the PhD, Take, took some classes together, figuring out rotations, spending, uh, really bonding during this first year. And so some of those friendships have survived, even though now we're like stuck away in our respective labs, doing very, very different kinds of things. I want to thank two of the communities that have led me to MIT to begin with. My school back in Russia that has exposed us to research really early on. Here we are in a 
uh, bio camp on the shores of the White Sea. Uh, and I was able to do my first experiments and I even have a publication from the work I did with them. And uh, of course my undergraduate lab at the University of Miami with Lucina Udin, who's now at UCLA. Lucina has introduced me to functional MRI and to cognitive neuroscience and that really gave me the platform to start doing this kind of work and to be able to jump right into my PhD after that. Thanks a lot to my family for their love and support and uh, for the many moments we were able to share together despite being oceans apart for the most part. Uh, thanks to my parents for encouraging me and supporting me in my decision to study in the US. They were really proud that when I got into MIT and that was really the main reason for me to be here. Uh, also thanks to my extended family who live in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Not all of them are pictured, but I love all of them for creating the sense of family and community. And thank you to some of my friends and loved ones who have been there for me throughout these years, despite not being in Boston. All of these friendships were formed way before I started the PhD, but they also keep me anchored and grounded and make me feel loved and appreciated. Uh, and uh, I guess a special thanks to my sister and my boyfriend who flew here to support me for this defense. And with that, I am ready to take questions. So I'm kind of curious a little bit about that. Do you think that if you were to look at some of the cerebellar activations or networks, that it's sort of mirroring what's going on in the language networks in the cortex, or is it doing something unique? Is it sort of unique computation with regard to some of the um, language processes that you've been investigating? Yeah. So uh, let me see if I. I can pull up the response profile for the cerebellum, but I don't see how to do that here. There we go. Okay. So, I think it's this one. Yeah. Okay. So, the two cerebellum ROIs here. Um, they're some of the more selective ones. They really respond to semantic tasks and uh, for sentences and pictures, but they don't really care about passive sentence reading. Maybe there is a lot of a little bit of a response. So it's not a language response in the cerebellum. It's really driven by the semantic task. And um, I am very new to the cerebellum literature. I did some uh, literature review once we found those regions, trying to understand what they do and what they mean. Um, but yeah, it really seems to be mirroring this cortical selectivity of a semantic task rather than being just this like general task response or general language response. So I don't know, I think these are like really nice clean results. Excited to learn more. Yeah. Thanks, Anya, for that beautiful talk. And congratulations. My question follows directly on this one. Um, I, I don't have a clear mental picture of what it means to be a semantic region and not respond more to sentences than non words. So can you talk me through that? How should I think about that? The way I think about this right now, and there is a lot of work that um, I plan to do, because as I said, there is a literature on cognitive control, which I know a little bit, but like there is more for me to learn, um, is that it's kind of like the multiple demand network, but for semantics, right? Instead of keeping information in short-term memory, right? When you're like adding up numbers or keeping track of squares on a screen, you are doing a task that's cognitive, but retrieving information from long-term memory, from semantic memory. So that's how I think about it. It's a controlled process is driven by a top, by a top-down demand, but it's not something that you just do spontaneously when you like encounter something meaningful. But doesn't sentence comprehension involve those same processes of building semantic meaning by connecting representations? It's or... not top-down driven. So if you are walking down the street and you hear a sentence, even if you're paying attention, you'll get the meaning right away. So it's really, it really seems to be a bottom-up process a lot of the time for sentence comprehension. So I think that's the main difference. We're not, like, 
if you're fluent in the language, you won't really get tired from listening to somebody. In, in a foreign language, it's very different, but your brain is exhausted by the end. But like a lot of our language processing really seems to be effortful. So that would be my guess. My guess would be that language processing is mainly bottom-up driven and takes place largely within the language regions. Whereas if you're answering a semantic question, it's top-down driven, it's effortful, you'll get tired, and so you need a different kind of machinery to do that kind of task. So just one more thought, because I sort of thought that too, that making meaning out of sentences could be thought of as effortless <laughs> and, and frankly obligatory, right? Like the Stroop test, which makes it surprising that by asking people to tell whether the stimulus is drifting left or right, you so completely suppress language representations in the sentence regions. Like on your account, you might say, just like walking down the street, seeing a sentence would cause you to effortlessly produce That's it. right. And we, if we only passively expose them to sentences, we um, would get a response in the language regions, like most of our localizer tasks are passive. With the moving left or right, we're just making it really challenging. The sentence is only on the screen for a couple of seconds, and you just re and it's moving really slowly, so you really kind of need to keep track of the pixels and where they move, so you just don't have the attention to read. So we're like, make, we're like actively suppressing sentence processing, which would have occurred otherwise. But yeah, no, I agree that like, you know, like, yeah, Nancy has mentioned as well, that it, it seems really puzzling that these semantic regions don't respond to sentences by themselves. And I don't know, I think it's exciting. I think that's why, like, we probably don't want to call them the meaning regions, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's too broad. Semantic demand, semantic control, something like that. Oh, I was going to ask a similar question, but I have another one too. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your Angular Gyrus results, and um, you were talking about there being maybe more overlap between the semantic regions and the language regions, and I was just kind of curious what you were thinking about that. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, so, okay, so these are the slides that, are, that I cut from the intro uh, because it's too long, but um, essentially when we look at the language network and we ask do, do different parts of the language network do different things? You might think that one part does syntax, one part does semantics or phonology, right? Like different modules coming together. We don't see that. In particular, the syntax semantic separation was positive in the literature. Many papers have looked at it. Um, F did a million papers showing that no, there isn't a separation. All of these regions seem to be doing roughly the same thing, responding more, for example, to more syntactically complex sentences except Angular Jaris. So it really shows that this region is kind of different from other language regions. It's um, not as functionally connected to the uh, brain. So if you look at the correlations between the language regions, the Angular Jaris one is this row here. It's lower than the rest. In this rest and state data where we identify the language network from uh, just correlations between brain regions, Angular Jaris is not part of that network. And uh, it doesn't respond to syntactic complexity. And in our semantic experiment for, for um, the king entertaining the jester, the Angular Jairus actually was the only one who responded equally strongly to sentences and pictures. So it did show this A model semantic profile in contrast to the core language regions like everything else. And so it really seems that it's doing something different. And um, well, when we found, when we looked at these semantic regions, we found a parcel that landed roughly where the language Angular Jarvis parcel landed. And so if we look at the overlap, there does seem to be some overlap between this language semantic parcel and um, uh, between the language parcel and the, between the language regions of interest and the semantic regions of interest in the Angular Jarvis. Which means that unlike pretty much all of the rest, the Angular Jairus does respond more to just sentences than just not words. Right? It's the only one of them that cares both about sentences over not words, a little bit, but also is invariant to input modality. So is it really like is it a junction point between these two networks? Is it just kind of doing its own thing? Is it a mix? Like it's unclear, but it's a, it's a really interesting region that really seems to split from the rest of the language network. And now we know that maybe we should be grouping it instead with semantic control regions. Yeah. You mean now just because you started talking about functional correlations between different regions, did you test like the 
correlation between those semantic regions and the language regions during naturalistic or in general tasks? Yeah, not yet. So the question is whether I should say the questions right away for, for, for Zoom people. Sorry about that. Uh, but yes, yeah, so the questions have we tested whether these semantic regions act as a coherent network? We have not yet, which is why I don't call them a network yet, or I try not to, because we don't know yet whether they really act together or whether they just they kind of you know are all active during the same task, but for different reasons. Well, actually, the, the question was about the correlation between the semantic regions and the language regions, but also, of course. The internal correlations within this. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well. I mean, given that the response profile is so different between the language regions and the semantic regions, I would also expect the um, oh, but you know the the, the correlations to be different. The yeah, yeah, like how high, how low? Like I agree, it's an interesting question. I mean, like there are those papers by Alex, for example, found of showing that like the social network and the language network are actually highly correlated while. Yeah no, I, no, yeah, no, yeah, 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 no, I, no, I think, it, I think it'd be really fun, and I think kind of, you know, showing a higher degree of correlation during a semantic task as opposed to like rest of passive reading would be strong evidence that these networks work together, which would make a lot of sense. There, I'm sure there are a million confounds, like you know, because they all like responded to the same stimuli. So yeah, it's, it's like it's like a whole different experiment to do. I agree, it would be a very cool experiment to do, and we're not there yet. Yeah, just yeah. mentioning like your response to Rebecca before was that during naturalistic reading you don't expect it to be engaged because it's more like mm -hmm. automatic. So that's exactly. So we, so we would also reading. expect to see a low degree of functional connectivity yeah, between so, them. Yeah. So yeah, TBD. Yeah. Are there Zoom questions? Yeah, I guess it seems like. Uh, if somebody can tell me the Zoom questions, you uh, can raise yeah. your hand or type. Yeah. It done. Go ahead. Um, this was absolutely fantastic and super interesting, and I love this work. Um, I am I'm glad this is happening, so we get a chance to talk about this. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, this is, I've been trying to wrap my head around, um, on the one hand, the claim that, you know, meaning is separate from semantics, and along the lines of, of Ray's claims that, that all semantics is conceptual semantics, and on the other hand, the fact that the, the language network really cares about meaning more than syntax, right? And so on the one hand, you can make the claim that meaning is, in whatever form you want to call it, right? Like world knowledge or whatever is not stored in the language network, it's stored elsewhere. But on the other hand, the language network cares so much about meaning more than other aspects of language. And so how do we reconcile these two things? Yeah, well, I mean, there is like a cop-out answer, and I don't know if it's the right answer, but um, it's, it might be because there is more information uh, to be extracted from semantics and from syntax, right? So uh, there is like that work from uh, Frank Mollick and Steve Pantados that shows how many bits you need to encode all of syntax versus all of semantics, and the amount of information you need for semantics is like incredibly high off of word meanings, right? And so uh, maybe it cares more about meaning just because there is more stuff there to process or to store or to memorize, right? And so maybe syntactic processing is just like not as effortful just because there is less information contained in there. So that would be my guess. Uh, ben? Yeah, I have a question, I guess, related to Idan's question, um, which would be, uh, could you comment on, I guess, the, the difference in this context between, yeah, word level meaning versus compositional semantics as perhaps being a delineating factor between these two, uh, between these two regions, recessive regions. So with word lists versus here you have interactions among objects without the, the use of words. Yes, so, well, yeah, so we have individual 
objects or concepts, right? That's one thing. And the other thing is putting them together into more complex expressions. And that's really where the heart of a lot of um, language as a foundation for thought view comes from, right? Like the merge operation, uh, the ability to like compose meanings in, in an infinite number of ways, right? That's why it's such an appealing idea to people saying, oh, like, look, we can do it in language. So maybe that's what we use when we think. Um, so the language network is sensitive to both word level meaning and sentence level meaning, and it's the same regions that care about both. So there doesn't seem to be a segregation there. We've seen that for, let's say, event semantics, compositional meaning in pictures, you don't need the language regions to do it, which also makes a lot of sense because I'm sure animals who don't have language can do a lot of compositional meaning extraction as well. No surprise there. Um, a little bit interesting is the claim that you can decode whether the entity is an agent or a patient from a um, left temporal region, which seems to be like li linguistic, right? There, there are papers that show that. Uh, for us, we, it seems that like you don't have to do it for pictures, like you don't need the language network to assign agent-patient roles. Um, and obviously the language network does word-level processing and combinatorial processing as well. Its combinatorial processing stops at a certain level, maybe a clause, and so um, like it cannot, like it doesn't really connect information across sentences as far as we know. And so what we think happens is that this information then gets packaged in some form and shipped off outside the language network, at which point this content is no longer linguistic. There might be a linguistic trace stored, you might be able to remember the linguistic form to some extent, but really at some point linguistic processing stops and more general conceptual processing begins elsewhere in the brain maybe the default mode network, maybe some domain-specific networks or both. Um, but it doesn't mean that like meaning is only this process of composing words into units, right? Like it, 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 it's just really hard when people talk about meaning to know what exactly they mean, whether it's linguistic by definition or not, right? And so I think that re really the way to get out of it is just say like, there is linguistic processing, there is um, processing that requires working with meaning but is not in the linguistic format, how do they interact, right? Without presupposing the existence of linguistic meaning like at all, or kind of having a separate word for it maybe. Yeah, Rebecca? But I had another question and it follows up on what we've just been discussing. So you're calling this a semantic control response but you showed us in your own data that when it's object semantics, you don't get this response, right? This is event semantics, not object semantics. So object semantics, we have data from a few people who did those, um, uh, uh, the event uh, experiments and the object experiments at the same time. Um, so, we, so, so it's really like only pilot that at this point. Um, there is some response to objects, uh, to this object semantic task in these uh, semantic control regions. Um, I don't know whether there is a significant difference between the semantic categories and the perceptual categories, which would really be required to know that they are engaged in some kind of semantic meaning more generally. So. Um, I think it is too early to tell what exactly the um, role of these regions is, whether it cares about compositionality, which is why events are more interesting and more useful than objects for identifying this network, um, whether it's a particular kind of tasks that really drives it or, uh, rather than like all semantic tasks generally. Uh, I agree that it's a little early to call them semantic control broadly. I'm saying like this is the closest thing we have in the literature, I think. So what I was going to ask was a mm -hmm. different thing, which is that you know Marina, who's on your committee, uh, many years ago published a paper using a verbs versus nouns mm -hmm. contrast, which found very robust activation for verbs relative to nouns. And I'm just wondering, do you think that your semantic picture semantic task with events is evoking the same representations as Marina got for verbs. Usually, stuff that's um, related to actions and events 
if people report a, as kind of a sp specific response profile for those categories, as opposed to like objects, they reported in the region of angular gyrus, right? Posterior temporal lobe, stuff like that. Was, was it frontal as well? Was it everything? It was um, middle temporal, MTG. Okay, so middle temporal for actions and posterior. And verbs. We didn't know if it was actions. It was verbs. Other people in the literature generally, including some of the like, I think maybe, maybe some of the maps I've shown, um, talk about MTG for actions, which would correspond to verbs. Um, and then for... Well, we mental state verbs. So they, they're not actions in the world. Maybe you want to say think and wonder is an action, but we deliberately tried to di unconfound those. That's what that paper was about, was unconfounding action and motion from and, verb. OK, so it was verbs over nouns, even if the nouns ha were event nouns, right? Like a hurricane that was party. Immediate. Huh? Event nouns were intermediate. They, yeah, Abstract yeah, yeah. yeah. So because because I, I remember it wasn't verbs versus nouns. I remember it was more complex, and there was like the there was clearly an effect of semantic category. And so, yeah, no, I think that's why this field is so broad. Right? Semantics and meaning is so complicated, and so we don't even know how to carve up the space. Right? Like what categories matter? To what extent they are selective to a particular domain? Events are interesting because events include both actions and the end that is doing the action. So it's kind of, it should be a composite, but sometimes like people don't treat it as such. Um, could you just run them together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we should definitely. We should, well, so yeah, we're like. Yeah, talking with them about like a battery of follow-up tasks that we need to run to kind of pin down the selectivity profile. But yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a great idea to include that setup as well. Yeah. How, are we, how are we doing on Zoom? Because I'm not reading the chat. Um, I don't see any, any hands. Yeah? I have maybe kind of a philosophical big picture question. Like you started from asking whether language and thought are the same or different. And so I was I guess that your like conclusion is that they're different. That they're not. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just wondering if we know what's thought. Like um, <laughs> it, like is thought like the semantic regions that you are no, right? So yes. if, if thought maybe thought is like all of these things together and then maybe without yes, them, I, would you do think a little bit differently? We don't know, right? Yeah, so I like thought is a very broad term. Here I'm you know, in like in my title I just said broader human cognition because I didn't want to get bo like bogged down in that whole debate. Um, some of the and so if that's the case, then just like, you know, pick a cognitive function of interest, you study it, you see whether it shares processing resources with language or not, and then you're good to go, and which is kind of, this, this is kind of what we get. Um, there's this whole question of inner thought, which I think is fascinating, and that's what a lot of people really care about or imply, like this is thought in a narrow sense, the stuff we, the, 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 the thoughts we think in our head before they come out as words or actions, right? And so that's what a lot of people seem to think is deeply linguistic. Um, I don't address this question directly in my empirical work, but I have a section in the thesis where I speculate on this. Um, essentially, we just don't see much engagement of the language regions um, in inner in inner thought, they are not very correlated with each other at rest, suggesting that it's not you know, doing very much. We also know that the extent to which people's thought is perceived as linguistic varies a ton from person to person. So if you think in words most of the time, of course you're gonna think that, that you know, language is really important for thinking, but some people just don't get that perception at all. Uh, and then of course cases from individuals with aphasia Right, give us some insight into what thought might be like without language, um, and specifically in an adult brain that grew up with language, but then language got taken away. Right, that's an important difference. And so there, um, I think you're right. Like the quality of the thought would change. Right, uh, the if you used to thinking in words all of the time, not having this inner voice uh, feels weird and feels disturbing, and people have reported that. Uh, but then also um, the, um, 
this um, art critic Tom Lubbock, who got a brain tumor that affected his language regions, uh, wrote um, a memoir, right, essentially like a running diary of his experiences that um, F quotes in, in her works, and I went and reread that when I was writing up the thesis. And it's really beautiful and really sad because this is the person who lives for words, right? Like he writes for a living and he kept writing up until the very end, even though it was becoming more and more difficult. And so at some point in the middle of the diary, he says, well, I think when my words are gone, my mind will be gone as well, right? I just can't imagine my, thought, my, my, my thoughts without words. But then a few months later, where his um, language is telegraphic at best, and, and he's like, communicating with his wife to transmit the meaning, um, he uh, stated that uh, his language to use things in the world is small, but his thoughts are vast as they ever were. And so he had this strong intuition that for him, his thought was so verbal, it was so important for him to use words to think and you know, describe things in the world. And yet even for him, when language went away, it really seemed that thought, a lot of it, a lot of conceptual thought remained. And so I think it's really beautiful and really, really illuminating.